morning. I was really afraid that Curtis McLean was going to introduce me. <laughs> Fortunately, that did not happen. I think probably one of the best things I have ever done for the Founders Conference was to introduce Curtis to it. He has become a regular at our Birmingham Conference. He has taken the lead in organizing this Midwestern Conference. And it's great for me to see such an esteemed brother operating in that fashion. And it's good to know I had a little part in that. I appreciate the Founders Conference a great deal. It has meant more to me than I can say. In fact, I have told friends sometimes that I don't know that I could tolerate being a Southern Baptist if it weren't for the Founders Conference. I so look forward to attending that every summer. It's a joy to see this Midwestern Conference get off the ground as it has. Today I'm to deal with the topic of William Screven and the Charleston Confession. It is most appropriate that we deal with the life and accomplishments of William Screven here at the Southern Baptist Founders Conference. For if any single individual may be considered the founder, under God, of Baptists in the southern United States, it is William Screven. Do I need to do something to stop that ringing? The mic too close. You're getting some feedback. Thank you. William Screven was, in the words of historian Leah Townsend, quote, the founder of the First Baptist Church in South Carolina, and apparently in the South, end quote. It is a matter of more than merely antiquarian interest that leads us to inquire into his life and beliefs, for William Screven established a paradigm for Southern Baptists which prevailed for nearly two centuries until our own era of decline and apostasy. But perhaps we're in the midst of a time when we see that paradigm restored. William Screven's life may be conveniently divided into three major periods on the basis of geography. The Old England period, extending from 1629 to 1668. The New England period, from 1668 to 1696, and the South Carolina period, from 1696 to 1713. First, we need to at least consider briefly the Old England period of William Scraven's life, extending from 1629 to 1668. William Screven, sometimes spelled as Scriven or other variants, was born in 1629, most likely in Somerton, the county of Somersetshire in southwestern England. Young William grew up during the reign of King Charles I, who ruled from 1625 to 1649. In the year of William's birth, the Massachusetts Bay Company was formed in England. And the following year saw the beginning of the Great Migration as Puritans moved from Old England to New England. That Great Migration continued throughout the 1630s due to hostile conditions toward evangelical believers in England. William lived through the English Civil War and the Puritan Revolution. 
he was a teenager at the time that the Westminster Confession of Faith and its coordinate standards were being produced in the 1640s. William turned 20 in the year of the execution of King Charles I, 1649. William Stravin saw the restoration of the monarchy in England in the person of Charles II in 1660. And he no doubt witnessed the harsh measures subsequently taken against religious nonconformists and now severely Anglican England. Very little can definitely be known about Screven's life in England as surviving records relating to him are scarce. The name William Scriven does appear as one of the signers of the Somerset Confession of 1656, a particular Baptist confession of faith. It is uncertain, however, whether this is the William Screven with whom we are now concerned. Our William would have been about 27 years of age at the time. So, from the standpoint of age, it would have been entirely possible for our William Screven to have been the signer of this particular Baptist Confession of Faith in 1656. The fact that Screven came to North America, <coughs> excuse me, in the mid-1660s, a time of intense religious persecution in England, suggests that he may already have been a dissenter or nonconformist, as those were called who refused to conform to the Church of England. At any rate, his name shows up suddenly in New England in 1668, indicating that Screven had decided to cast his lot with the English immigrants of North America. This brings us to the New England period of Screven's life, 1668 to 1696. Screven's time in New England again divides according to geography. The five years from 1668 to 1673 were spent in Massachusetts, and the 23 years from 1673 to 1696 in Maine. Concerning Screven's years in Massachusetts, the public record affords us a few details. For example, he witnessed a deed at Salisbury, Massachusetts in 1668. And the following year, Screven signed on as an apprentice for four years to George Carr a shipbuilder in Amesbury, Massachusetts. Both these communities are in extreme northeastern Massachusetts, near the border with New Hampshire, and only about 15 miles from Maine. In 1673, after his apprenticeship had expired, William Screven shows up in the records of Maine, where he purchased 10 acres of land in Kittery, a small town spelled K-I-T-T-E-R-Y, just across the border from New Hampshire, which was a coastal town just barely within the boundaries of Maine. The community of Kittery was known as a haven for religious dissent. Given Scraven's later activities, it is not unlikely that he settled there for just that reason. We're going to see it here quite a non-conformist in more than one sense of that word. The following year, 1674, saw Scraven married Bridget Cutts, C-U-T-T, daughter of Robert Cutts, Sr. This union, besides producing several children, brought Scraven into alignment with one side in a political conflict which was causing turmoil in Maine. It seems that there were conflicting claims to the right to control New Hampshire and Maine. One claim was exercised by the Council for New England, an English group 
which included Sir Ferdinando Gorgias and Captain John Mason. The other claim was maintained by the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Puritans had settled to the south in Maine and New Hampshire and Massachusetts Bay. Massachusetts acted upon its claim, extending its authority into New Hampshire in 1643 and into Maine in 1652. This political development brought with it religious ramifications, for Massachusetts insisted on maintaining an established system of congregational churches sanctioned by laws requiring attendance at worship services, financial support for the local congregational church by taxation, and the baptism of infants. This system was intolerant of dissent. The First Baptist Church of Boston, organized in 1665, was persecuted for its first 15 years of existence. In the meantime, the heirs of the original Mason Gorgeous claims were pressing their case in England, while settlers in New Hampshire and Maine sent petitions to the English government in 1665 urging royal control of these colonies. But in 1678, Massachusetts Bay purchased from the heirs of Gorgias the Maine patent and sent a governor and commissioners into Maine in 1680. In other words, Massachusetts is taking over the government of Maine. This was done in defiance of the king who had threatened to dissolve the entire arrangement by which Massachusetts was exercising a claim on territory in Maine. William Screven fit in with the pattern of nonconformity and protest in Maine. In July 1675, Screven was indicted for not attending the congregational meeting in Kittery, but he was never prosecuted. Screven was among more than 100 residents of Kittery, Maine, who in 1679 signed a petition to the King of England asking him to take control of Maine. He joined more than 50 others in signing another petition asking for royal control in 1680 as well. This struck me as a bit peculiar. Here is a Baptist adhering to similar theology to the Puritans in Massachusetts Bay, yet Screven was requesting the government of England to take royal control of the colony of Maine. The reason? The ruling Congregationalist Puritans would allow no dissent. I recognize that many of us hold the Puritans in great honor, but when we begin to look at at least the American Puritans from a Baptist perspective, some of them come across as less than attractive. They're persecuting some of our Baptist forebears. In the following year, Scraven, his wife, and Humphrey Churchwood of Kittery joined the First Baptist Church of Boston, being baptized on July 21, 1681. Scraven was summoned to court in Maine once again to explain his actions. He expressed his strong disagreement with infant baptism, apparently refusing to have his own baby baptized. It is uncertain whether Screven possessed his Baptist convictions before leaving England. That is a possibility, and clearly was the case that he was the Screven who signed the Somerset Confession, or whether he acquired these Baptist beliefs after arriving in North America. 
for which there would have been ample opportunity, as Baptist influence was present in New England when Stravin arrived. The year 1682 was a momentous one for William Strevin. He saw his licensure to preach, his being jailed for his Baptist views and practices, his ordination to the ministry, and the formation of a Baptist church in Kittery. We'll take up these one by one. Strevin was commended to the Boston Church for the Gospel Ministry in a letter written by Humphrey Churchwood, a resident of Kittery. Churchwood referred to him as, quote, our beloved brother, William Screven, who is through free grace, okay, free grace, gifted and endued with the spirit of veterans to preach the gospel. We're being called by us, who are visibly joined to the church, end quote, and Churchwood indicated that he looked forward to Stravin's ordination and the further advancement of God's kingdom in that area. He refers to their group as a church, although they have not yet formally organized themselves as a church. The First Baptist Church of Boston immediately extended its approval of Strevin and his ministry, licensing him on January 11, 1682. William Scraven was licensed to preach on my birthday. That touches me. James P. Boyce was born on my birthday. I'm even more proud of that. Or maybe I was born on his birthday. In the meantime, the Baptists of Boston and Kittery have been experiencing the displeasure of the Congregationalist Puritan Authority. The record indicates that on March 13, 1682, Scraven was arraigned before the Provincial Council in York, Maine. York is just a few miles northeast of Kittery, where Scraven lived. There, he was reported to have made, quote, according to the official record now, presumptuous, if not blasphemous, speeches about the holy ordinance of baptism, end quote. Scraven, quote, seemed to owe and justify the matter in his speeches, end quote. He didn't deny it. He said that infant baptism was, quote, an ordinance of the devil. He replied that he conceded no ordinance of God, but an invention of man, end quote. He, quote, put us to prove by any positive command in the gospel or scriptures that there was infant baptism. End quote. Raven seemed not to be backward about expressing his beliefs. These people had legal authority over him. The court required Straven to post bond of 100 pounds to assure his appearance at the court of pleas to meet in April. Scraven refused. He would not post bond. Therefore, he was put in jail, where he apparently remained for the intervening month until the court of pleas met in April. When the court of pleas met on April 12, they fined Scraven 10 pounds and ordered him to stop holding unauthorized worship services in his home on Sunday and to attend the service established by law. Evidently, he did not stop, for he was hailed into court again on June 28, 1682. This was General Assembly. This was the highest court in the colony. He was charged with refusing to obey the former order to stop holding unauthorized worship services. Scraven was offered his liberty if he would desist from this practice, but he refused, whereupon the court required a bond to guarantee his good behavior and that he be held until the judgment of the court was fulfilled. 
At this point, Gravan offered to leave the province of Maine within, quote, a very short time, end quote, and was apparently released by the authorities. Historian Robert Baker conjectures that Gravan may have had in mind another place of ministry to which he might lo relocate himself, perhaps Boston or Swansea, Massachusetts. But events soon altered that plan. The turn of events that may have changed Strabin's mind was the prospect of organizing a Baptist church in Kittery. And the authorities loved this. Strabin wrote to the Baptist church in Boston on September 13, 1862, referring to the desire of his mother-in-law to be baptized, and referring also to the coming of messengers from Boston to Kittery, apparently for the purpose of organizing a church there. This letter again was written September 13, 1682. Something of the Christian spirit of William Screven may be discerned from the first paragraph of this letter. This is what Scraven wrote. To Thomas Skinner, Boston, born the church. Dearly beloved brethren in the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of Saints, I and my wife salute you with our Christian love and our Lord Jesus, Hoping through grace, these few lines will find you in health of body and mind. Blessed be God for Jesus Christ, in whom he is pleased to count his saints meet to be partakers of the blessed rest, provided for them in his mansion house eternally in the heaven. That will be a happy day when all the saints shall join together in the sounding of his praise. The good Lord, enable us to prepare for that blessed day. To that end, brethren, let us pray, everyone himself, for himself, and for one another, that God would please to search our hearts and reins so as that we may walk with God here and hereafter well with him in glory. The messengers from the Baptist Church in Boston indeed arrived included Isaac Hull, Thomas Skinner, and Philip Squire. And on September 25, 1682, the congregation at Kittery was constituted a properly organized church. And William Strevin was ordained as its pastor in Humphrey Churchwood as deacon. Of special interest is the doctrinal foundation of this church. The messengers of the Boston Church reported, quote, We have found them a competent number and in the same faith with us, for upon careful examination of them in matters of doctrine and practice, and so finding one with us by their, we hope, conscientious acknowledgement of the confession of faith put forth by the elders and brethren of the churches in London and the country in England dated in the year 1682. The reference to a confession of faith is apparently to the Second London Confession, which was first drawn up and issued in 1677, and 12 years later was publicly subscribed and reissued, becoming known as the Baptist Confession of 1689. The reference to the year 1682 and the Messenger's Correspondence perhaps indicates there was a reprinting of the Confession that year. I noted that my brother Ron Rumberg's uh, volume on the, uh, the southern documents of the people called Baptists does indicate there was a reprinting of the Second London Confession in 1682, but he did not document that. I have not seen any other source that indicates a 1682 printing of that confession, but seems that it may have taken place. The Kittery congregation 
consisting of 17 members, 10 men and 7 women, also adopted a church covenant, which historian Baker says may be the oldest Baptist covenant in America. It reads as follows. I'm going to read the, the church covenant of the Kittery Baptist Church. You need to listen carefully because it consists of 15 lines in my typescript and it's all one sentence. We thought uh, book titles were lengthy in that day. Here's a church covenant that is one sentence long. It would be interesting to have a congregation recite it together. I hope I can do it justice. We whose names are here underwritten do solemnly and on good consideration, God assisting us by his grace, give up ourselves to the Lord and to one another in solemn covenant, wherein we do covenant and promise to walk with God and with one another in a due and faithful observance of all his most holy and blessed commandments, ordinances, institutions, or appointments, revealed to us in his sacred word of the Old and New Testaments, and according to the grace of God and light at present through his grace given us, or hereafter he shall please to discover and make known to us through his Holy Spirit, according to the same blessed word all the days of our lives. And this will we do if the Lord graciously please to assist us by his grace and spirit and to give us divine wisdom strength, knowledge, and understanding from above to perform the same without which we can do nothing. John 15, 4, 2 Corinthians 3, 5. This covenant breathes a spirit of humility, dependence on God's grace, submission to God and one another, and openness to further light to break forth from God's word. And evidently, these Baptists saw no conflict between their adoption of a lengthy and detailed confession of faith, which the Second London Confession was, and their expectation that God would bring home to them fresh understandings of divine truth through the Scriptures. Persecution continued against the Baptists in Maine in the person of their leader, William Screven. Screven was brought before a court again in October 1683 for refusing to leave the province as earlier promised. And the court declared that the earlier sentence was still in effect. He was also ordered in Maine 1684 to appear before the General Assembly in June, apparently because he had not stopped holding unauthorized meetings you expect he's a pastor of a Baptist church. Apparently he did not intend to stop. And those meetings continued and he was brought to court once again. However, there is no record of further punishment or proceedings against Screven. He did not appear before the General Assembly in June 1684. In fact, the legal records of Kittery for the next 12 years show Screven active in the community and even holding positions of civic responsibility, such as witnessing transactions, serving on grand juries, serving as representative, commissioner, and moderator for the town of Kittery. The cessation of active persecution is likely due to the fact that New England was undergoing a period of considerable political turmoil at this time, with royal control being established in the region and greater religious toleration becoming the norm. Although little that is definite concerning Screven's religious activities during this period can be gleaned from the historical records that survive, it seems that he remained in Maine, continued faithfully in his convictions and service, and became a respected, esteemed, trusted, 
an honored member of the community, even though he was a Baptist pastor. He was also a compassionate man, taking into his home two children who were not his own. The South Carolina period of William Scraven's life, which we take up thirdly, extends from 1696 to 1713. The final period of William Scraven's life involves his removal, along with his congregation, to South Carolina and the establishment of the first organized Baptist church in that colony and in the South. William Scraven's name does not appear in the records of the colony of Maine after June 1696, but it does show up in the records of South Carolina where he received two land warrants in December 1696. It appears that for several reasons, Scraven, his family, which include his wife Bridget, with five daughters and seven sons, and took in a couple extras besides, and a party of perhaps 15 companions, mostly fellow church members, made the move by ship from Maine to South Carolina during the late summer or early fall of 1696. Scraven and others of his group obtained land about 40 miles north of Charleston near the Cooper River at a site which became known as Somerton. This area, I understand, is now under Lake Moultrie. Somerton was the name of Scraven's birthplace in England, although it appears that the South Carolina site bore this name before Scraven arrived. Evidently, there were Baptists in the area before Scraven's group arrived. They were likely gathering for worship in private homes, perhaps by 1682, more certainly by 1693 in Charleston. It seems that Scraven's church met for a while at Somerton and moved to Charleston in 1698, where it united with an unorganized group of Baptists, with Scraven becoming the first pastor of this, the First Baptist Church of Charleston. The congregation met in a private home until a plot of land was given to it in 1699, and a meeting house was constructed probably in 1700. According to historian Leah Townsend, under, quote, under Mr. Screven's leadership, the Charleston Church adopted the London or Philadelphia, I think that's an anachronism, confession of faith, omitting the requirements of laying on of hands and ruling elders, end quote. She says that, quote, the adoption of these decidedly Calvinistic articles proves that the majority of the Charleston group were particular Baptists, end quote though there were evidently some General Baptists in the area and probably in that congregation. Townsend goes on to say, quote, their action is important in view of the later doctrinal differences in the church and in view of the fact that the Charleston church was long the leader of Baptists of South Carolina, end quote. A full account of Scraven's activities between 1700 and 1713 is impossible to develop due to the sparsity of records available. Scraven's ministry must have had some effect, however, for there survive various complaints and calumnies against him from the pens of Congregationalist and Presbyterian ministers. You know that a Baptist pastor is doing something right when the Congregationalists and Presbyterians complain against him. It is possible that due to Scraven's declining health, the Charleston congregation briefly made use of the services of a minister named White from England. But in June 1707, when Scraven responded to a call to become the pastor of the First Baptist 
church in Boston, where he had been baptized, Scriven declined the call on the grounds that he could not be spared where he was in Charleston due to the death of the minister from England. So it appears that at this uh, advanced age, Scriven was still actively ministering in Charleston. A letter written by Screven in August 1708, the last letter of record from him, indicates that there were 90 members of the Baptist congregation in Charleston in 1708. William Screven lived until October 10, 1713, when he died at the age of 84. Sometime before his death, Screven wrote a treatise entitled an Ornament for Church Members, which was published after his death, but which no longer survives except in a few excerpts collected by historians. It is significant, however, that Scraven's last request of the congregation in Charleston was that, quote, you as speedily as possible supply yourselves with an able and faithful minister. Be sure you take care that the person be orthodox in faith and of blameless life, and does own the confession of faith put forth by our brethren in London in 1689. Scraven clearly wanted his successor as pastor of the Charleston congregation to be an adherent of the theology of the 1689 London Confession. From this brief survey of the life of William Screven, it is possible to make a few pertinent observations. In the first place, it may safely be said that William Screven was a convinced Baptist. His willingness to undergo persecution and opposition for his Baptist beliefs and principles, his steadfast adherence to Baptist convictions in the face of such hostility, and his faithfulness in Baptist views to the end of his life testify to a solidity of conviction based on what he believed to be scriptural teaching. We might even go so far as to say that Screven was passionately Baptist. It seemed to reach to the very core of his being, if we may judge by his actions. Although we have little in the way of writings from William Screven, it is clear that he held to and fought for several principles which have historically been central to the Baptist way. Civil liberty, freedom from the demands of a state church, the practice of believers' baptism, and the principle of a gathered church called out of the world. In all these ways, he held fiercely to what is quintessentially a Baptist position. In the second place, we may declare that William Scraven was a confessional Baptist. The church which he organized in Maine in 1682 adopted a confession of faith. The relocated and enlarged church established under his leadership in Charleston in 1696 reaffirmed that confession of faith. And as he was preparing to pass from the scene, he urged the Charleston church to secure a pastor who adhered to the same confession of faith. Screven apparently saw no contradiction between, on the one hand, a stout Baptist stance on matters of policy, and on the other, a clear and full affirmation of Baptist beliefs. He did not seem to favor doctrinal vagueness or diversity, but supported a forthright declaration of one's theological position with a high degree of precision. In the third place, we may note that William Scraven was a Reformed Baptist. The Confession of Faith to which he and his congregation adhered was the Second London Confession 
1677 and 1689, which had been adopted by the particular Baptists of England. This confession was a revision and adaptation to Baptist use of two earlier models, the Westminster Confession of the Presbyterians and the Savoy De Confession of the Congregationalists. It will not be out of line to note some of the features of this confession of faith. The Charleston Confession, as we may call it, has a high view of scripture. We could perhaps call it the biblical view of the Bible itself. As Tom Nettles and Russ Bush point out, the first sentence of this Baptist Confession is an addition to the Westminster Confession's article on Holy Scripture. That sentence reads, the Holy Scripture is the only sufficient, certain, and infallible rule of all saving knowledge, faith, and obedience. End quote. Article 1, Section 1. This statement, as Nettles and Bush demonstrate, makes four affirmations about Scripture which are developed elsewhere in the Confession. Those four affirmations are that the Bible is exclusive in its authority, sufficient in its content, errorless in its presentation, and incapable of error in its representation of the truth. On the doctrine of Scripture, then, this first Southern Baptist confession would seem to have something to say to Southern Baptists in the 20th century. The Charleston Confession was also reformed in its soteriology. It clearly sets forth the distinctive elements of the Calvinistic view of human salvation. For example, it affirms humanity's radical corruption. All humanity fell in the sin of our first parents, quote, all becoming dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the faculties and parts of soul and body. End quote. Article 6, Section 2. This leaves humanity in a condition of spiritual bondage excuse me, and inability. Quote again, We are utterly indisposed, disabled, <clears throat> and made opposite to all good, and wholly inclined to all evil. Article 6, Section 4. I hope nobody's drunk from this glass yet. The Confession affirms God's sovereign choice in the bestowal of salvation on fallen human beings. Quote, By the decree of God, for the manifestation of his glory, some men and angels are predestinated or foreordained to eternal life through Jesus Christ to the praise of his glorious grace. Article 3, Section 3, and in Section 5 of the same article, we're told that this choice was made by God, quote, out of his mere free grace and love, without any other thing in the creature as a condition or cause moving him thereunto, end quote. The Confession affirms Christ's purposeful atonement. Quote, the Lord Jesus, by his perfect obedience and sacrifice of himself, which he through the eternal spirit once offered up unto God, has fully satisfied the justice of God, has procured reconciliation, and purchased an everlasting inheritance in the kingdom of heaven for all those whom the Father has given unto him. I don't think those affirmations could be made of and a universal atonement. It affirms the powerful and effective call of the Holy Spirit. Quote, Those whom God has predestinated unto life, he is pleased in his appointed and accepted time, effectually to call by his word and spirit, out of that state of sin and death in which they are by nature, to grace and salvation by Jesus Christ, enlightening their minds spiritually and savingly to understand the things of God, taking away their heart of stone and giving unto them a heart of flesh, renewing their wills and by his almighty power 
determining them to that which is good and effectually drawing them to Jesus Christ, yet so as they come most freely, being made willing by his grace. Article 10, Section 1. And the, con the confession affirms God's preservation of his people, those whom God has accepted in the beloved, effectually called, sanctified by his spirit, and given the precious faith of his elect unto, can neither totally nor finally fall from the state of grace, but shall certainly persevere therein to the end and be eternally saved. Article 17, Section 1. And this, Section 2, goes on to say this perseverance, this perseverance of the saints depends not upon their own free will, but upon the immutability of the decree of election, flowing from the free and unchangeable love of God the Father, upon the efficacy of the merits and intercessions of Jesus Christ, and union with him, the oath of God, the abiding of his spirit, and the seed of God within them, and the nature of the covenant of grace, from all of which arises also the certainty and infallibility uh, thereof, their perseverance. The confession thus leaves no doubt as to its conformity to a reformed, and we believe a biblical view of divine initiative in human salvation. If all this may be said of William Screven, it may also be by extension said of the first Southern Baptist Church in Charleston, South Carolina. It was decidedly Baptist, clearly confessional, and definitely reformed, having adopted the confession we have been considering just now. Furthermore, First Baptist Church of Charleston went on to become the leading church of the region. It led in the formation of the Charleston Association, which adopted the Charleston Confession in 1767. It led in the formation of the South Carolina State Convention in 1821, the first in the South. This congregation also led in educational and missionary efforts among Baptists in the South and produced two of the founders of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary, Basil Manley, Jr. and James P. Boyce. And I understand from our brother Tom Askell that First Baptist Church of Charleston recently secured a Reformed Baptist pastor. There can be no doubt that William Screven left a great legacy for Southern Baptists. There is also no doubt in the minds of many Southern Baptists today that we would do well to honor that legacy, not merely as a relic of the past, but as a living faith for the present and as the basis of hope for the future. Southern Baptists have an honorable heritage from William Screven. It is a heritage and is baptistic a heritage that is confessional, a heritage that is reformed. It is a heritage of which we need not be ashamed.